first, we'll be heading to Cairo, today the capital of Egypt, for number 10, my countdown top 10 treasures. Meet Ramses III. Ramses was a man with lots of enemies. He had to fight off invading armies from the Middle East to defend Egypt. But the real trouble came from within the kingdom. His wife, Queen Tai, wanted her son on the throne, so she hatched a plot to assassinate her husband. Uh, now we know all about this because it's recorded on a papyrus that's now in Turin, and this historical event is known as the Harim Conspiracy. We're told that the plot failed. The conspirators were arrested and were sentenced to death. But what happened to Ramses? Is there any evidence on this mummy that tells us exactly what happened to Ramses? Yes. After a medicine scan around his uh, neck, we found bandages, as you can see here. And we didn't know why that bandages is a little bit thick than the other bandages. And after made a CT scan, we found that he had been assassinated by cutting his throat. Oh, wow. Mm. So that was definitely, so this was a mortal wound, so he, he couldn't have survived it? No, he cannot survive because it's big enough to cut the neck and to make the king die within a few minutes after the, bl the blood expelled out. So this is very amazing after 3,000 of years we revealed the secret about which way he had been assassinated. That's the incredible thing about history, mm. is that it's constantly changing. There are, there are constantly new stories, new, new chapters being written in. Without doubt. And now we're exploring the Nile Delta, where the Great River Nile meets the Mediterranean Sea, in search of number nine, now countdown of great Egyptian treasures. The Rosetta Stone. It was a stone covered in Egyptian hieroglyphs. But that's not all. Underneath, there was what seemed to be a translation in ancient Greek. The experts began by looking at the Greek, which they could still read, and they found the word Ptolemy, which they knew was a pharaoh's name. The challenge was to find the ancient Egyptian equivalent. What they did was they looked in the hieroglyphs to try to find a cartouche. It's a bullet-shaped thing, and inside, that's where the pharaoh's name was always written. This was the very first word they were able to read in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. The first step in deciphering a language that had been dead for 1,500 years. So down here, you've got the name Ptolemy in Greek. And then up here is the name Ptolemy in ancient Egyptian, but this is how they managed to decode it. So what you have is a square that stands for a P, a semicircle for a T, that kind of rope shape is an O, the lion is an L, underneath here you've got an M, and then these two reeds are a Y. So slowly, slowly, it meant that they could start to piece together an ancient Egyptian alphabet and that meant they could suddenly translate ancient Egyptian. And next, we're going to investigate a lost treasure that was plastered in so many hieroglyphs, it took 40 years just to copy them down. When they were finally all translated, they told tales of incest and murder, and at the center of it all, the family of Egypt's most famous queen. Cleopatra. To get there, we're travelling more than 600 miles up the River Nile to a city in Upper Egypt for treasure number eight. This is our next treasure, the Temple of Edfu. This splendid temple was built by a single royal family known as the Ptolemies, who ruled Egypt from the 4th century BC until the last and most famous of the whole dynasty, Cleopatra. The entire building tells the story of the great Egyptian queen and her family through the words and pictures carved into the stone walls. 
This whole gateway was built by Cleopatra's dad, Ptolemy, and you can see Ptolemy there, rather graphically shown slaying his enemies and sacrificing prisoners. But Ptolemy's enemies weren't all outsiders. His own daughter, Cleopatra's older sister, led an armed rebellion against him, which he brutally crushed. He had her killed, leaving little Cleopatra as his heir. With a family like that, you could say that for Cleopatra, this temple wasn't a symbol of royal harmony, but a nest of snakes as generation after generation of close family members engaged in a deadly game of intrigue, murder, and incest. In fact, out of these 12 ancestors of Cleopatra, every single one was in an incestuous marriage, and at least seven came to a sticky end. So when Cleopatra herself came to the throne in 51 BC, she inherited a tricky family legacy, to say the least. But also, this stunning temple. A family power base. Just outside Egypt's capital, Cairo, is one of the most famous treasures in Egypt. It's our treasure number seven. At number seven on our list of treasures, it's the Great Sphinx at Giza. The Sphinx crouches at the entrance to one of the busiest tourist sites in the world, the Giza Plateau, famous for its mind-blowingly huge pyramids. But even in this epic setting, the Sphinx is a showstopper. I always find the sheer scale of this incredible creature absolutely jaw-dropping. It was the biggest sculpture made in ancient Egypt, and it's still one of the largest anywhere in the world. But that wasn't obvious when explorers first encountered the Sphinx. The giant statue was buried neck deep in sand. All they could see poking out was an enormous stone head. But they were mystified. But once they'd cleared the sands, they could appreciate the Sphinx in all its crazy glory. A human head and shoulders on the body of a lion, taller than a six-storey building. The Sphinx was built on such a massive scale because it had an incredibly important job to do. Basically, to be a giant guard dog, carved out of the rock to keep watch over the pharaoh buried in the pyramid behind all the way beyond Egypt's far-flung southern border. But it's a journey that's worth every moment to reach number six in our countdown of top 10 treasures. When you finally get here to Abu Simbel, it is impossible not to be awestruck. This temple was built by Ramses II, probably the greatest of all Egyptian pharaohs. He ruled for an astonishing 66 years, one of the longest reigns in history. And boy, he loved to build. This whole temple is a monument to his reign. And out here, beyond the southern border, he's also giving a powerful warning to the neighbors. There's just one overriding message to this temple. It's saying, I'm in charge, don't mess with me. This is Ramses' ego built in stone, and it has left us with the most awe-inspiring place. The temple walls are covered with ferocious images of the pharaoh defeating his enemies. Number five in our countdown. The Step Pyramid is revolutionary, one of the earliest surviving monuments in all of Egypt and the world's first ever pyramid. 150 years older than the Sphinx and the famous Great Pyramid at Giza. 
and it's also the world's first stone cut building. But it's not what's above ground that gets Saqqara onto our list of treasures, but what lies underneath my feet. Because down here, there is a whole subterranean world. And not only that, but here there are thousands, possibly millions, of mummified bodies. This is the final resting place for 16 of Egypt's earliest pharaohs. But it was also a graveyard for queens and nobles and ordinary Egyptians for 3,000 years. So many mummies were buried here that Saqqara became Egypt's biggest city of the dead, stretching over four square miles. All these mummies are remarkable enough, but archaeologists have also discovered something else. There aren't just humans hidden here. But animals too, in numbers that beg a belief. Eight million mummified dogs in one mass grave. Four million ibis birds in another. The necropolis was also home to cats, baboons, crocodiles, fish, and some, well, it's anyone's guess. Next, let's go to one of the most famous places in Egypt, an ancient city on the banks of the Nile, to discover treasure number four. The Temple of Luxor. For centuries, this is one of Egypt's most splendid temples. But if you're imagining somewhere silent and serious, think again. This was party central. The really brilliant thing about this place um, isn't just its architectural splendor, but the fact that it would have been absolutely pulsing with life. Um, so here you've had priests with their heads and their bodies shaved, and all these columns, you can see some of the traces there, they'd have been absolutely bright with a kind of riot of color. And then when you came out into the courtyards, there were plates of electrum, which was a, a mixture of gold and silver that would have reflected back the sun's rays. So it would kind of ricochet out as an extraordinary light show. During festivals, Luxor was the ultimate party venue. All of life was here, indulging in wild, drunken blowouts. Singers, magicians and dancers, like these gorgeous, back-flipping acrobats. This time, we're leaving behind the great cities and heading into Rocky Mountains, not far from Luxor, for treasure number three. Uh, today, we simply describe it as the Valley of the Kings. From around 1600 BC, the mummified bodies of pharaohs were brought here to be buried in tombs cut into the steep sides of the valley. Hidden within this rocky terrain are 63 tombs and they're just the ones we've found so far. They include the tombs of the most famous pharaohs in Egyptian history. Tutankhamun, the boy king. Ramses the Great, builder of Abu Simbel. And our royal assassination victim, Ramses III. Robbers were a key reason Egyptians began to bury their rulers in this remote location. Up until now, um, pharaohs had been buried in great big pyramids, a bit like the Step Pyramid that we saw at Saqqara. Um, these were fantastic demonstrations of their might and their power, but they were also huge signs saying that treasure was buried there, so they were incredibly tempting for robbers and raiders. And that's why the ancient Egyptians began to bury their kings far from prying eyes in this valley. So remote, they hoped it would keep them and their tombs safe forever. But there is one treasure that was always going to be as near as damn it, the top of the list. We're staying right here in the Valley of the Kings for treasure number two. 
When this tomb was first opened in 1922 by the English archaeologist Howard Carter, very few had heard of the pharaoh whose body lay inside. But he was soon to become a household name, Tut and Kamun. And that was because, unlike the other tombs in the valley, this tomb's treasures had been kept safe from thieves. And what fabulous treasures they are. This is one of three spectacular gold coffins found here, each lying inside the other like Russian dolls. The outer two were made of wood covered in gold, but the inner one was solid gold weighing a hundred kilos. Today, that gold alone would be worth over three million pounds. Getting up this close, um, you really understand why they used gold uh, to make these amazing coffins. Um, because the idea was that covered in gold, the gods would realize that these pharaohs, these god men were actually divine. And inside the inner gold coffin, lay the body of the pharaoh. So here he is. This is the mummified body of the teenager Tutankhamun. I really feel for him. He looks so fragile. Mind you, he's the only mummy in the entire valley still in his original tomb, lying all alone in an empty chamber. But originally, the rooms of this tomb were jam-packed with what Carter described as wonderful things. Pharaohs were buried with hundreds, often thousands, of their precious and personal objects. Um, so things like weapons and beds and jewellery and food and sort of packed lunches. Uh, some of them even took with them their favourite pets who'd been mummified. So it was everything you could possibly need for your journey to the afterlife. Number one on our countdown of Egyptian treasures is the Great Pyramid at Giza. Rising almost 150 metres out of the ground, it remains one of the most gobsmacking constructions in the world. It took over 20 years uh, to build this pyramid, and it's been estimated that each one of these blocks, which weighs between one and two and a half tonnes each, would have been put in place every two minutes, every day of that 20 years. The stone was brought from all across Egypt, including granite from more than 500 miles away in the south of the country. The entire Giza plateau would have been teeming with activity. Over 10,000 workers toiling at the greatest building site the world had ever seen. When the Great Pyramid was finally completed, it was the tallest man-made structure anywhere in the world. A record it held for 4,000 years. However many times I come here, I find this monument completely mind-blowing. I mean, and if you just think of how that affects me now, today, and I know how it was built, how it would have impacted on the imagination of history across not just centuries, but thousands of years. And originally, the pyramid would have looked even more imposing. Covered in polished white limestone, it would have blazed out under the desert sun. Much of that casing was actually physically shaken off around 700 years ago, uh, when there was a massive earthquake around here. But you can get a hint of what it would have looked like if you look at the tip of that neighbouring pyramid. So just try to imagine this landscape in its heyday. It would have gleamed out with innovation. It must almost have felt futuristic. 